Hey everyone, it's Christina from McCrory. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about right now about um, creating a bee habitat or a bee hotel at your own house. So kind of everything that we do here at McCrory and all of our educational programming, we try to revolve around our central mission of connecting people and plants through education, discovery, research, and enjoyment of the natural and built landscape. So here's a couple of the, this is one of the native bees to, to South Dakota, the mason bees, and there's some other um, pretty adorable <laughs> native native bees. But this one in particular has some, is kind of fun to build a habitat for, and it's one of these cavity nesting bees. It's a gentle bee. They don't have any queens or stores of honey to protect, so um, you know your chances of getting stung are really low. The female's capable of stinging, but really would only do it in protection of their life, um, like if it was squeezed or something like that. They only travel about 300 feet to find food and pollen, so having those sources, um, those those needs for them close to the habitat that you set up is going to be something. Um, Pretty, pretty important uh, uh, for your habitat. Um, I'll kind of go to the next slide, which has some of these facts written out. It's not, you don't have a cute bee to look at, but you, but you can at least see some of this information and that way you can, you know, um, reference back to it if you're ever interested to look at this stuff too. Um, they emerge when the air temps are about 55. They only live about five to six weeks and the, um, they move in a zigzag pattern, which makes them really efficient pollinators which for small spaces. I thought that was, that's a pretty neat thing. So they bring mud to their nests and wall in their eggs. That's an important thing too, uh, for again, considering your, the area of your habitat. They bring nectar and pollen back for their larvae. And just to keep in mind, there are some other native cavity nesting bees in our region, like the leaf cutter bees that are active, you know, at different times of the season as well. So here's some more information on the mason bee life cycle, just because I find it really fascinating. And when I was going into this, I thought that that helped me figure out how to manage the habitat when I understood um, when she's nesting, when she's out looking for you know, looking for food and things like that. But I'll just um, leave that here for your guys' reference to read through as you kind of have time or would like to, to, to look through that information. So now for the habitat that you're gonna create, these are the things, um, some major things that you'll wanna consider for your habitat. Pollinator plants, pesticide use, um, or lack thereof, I guess, the mud and water, um, nesting site and maintenance, each one of those. So for pollinator plants, um, just just some kind of useful information, how they're drawn to bright white, yellow, blue, purple, and UV. Um, they see in a spectrum of light that we don't see. Um, there's some, you know, glasses out there or photos that people will share to show what flowers look like to bees that we don't see and it almost looks like a little helicopter landing pad <laughs> and that's a that's a pretty neat thing so but for what we can we can observe um, those are kind of the colors that you'd like might want to keep in mind for you for your pollinator garden they like fresh mild and pleasant scents um, and they like the pollen often sticky and scented, shallow flowers with again that landing platform or tubular flowers. Um, some ideas would be to replace part of your lawn with flowering plants, um, that way to provide those bees some habitat and some food. Plant native flowers, especially for those native bees, that's the food that they um, are, are looking for, are those native flowers that they've kind of co-evolved with. So like single flower tops, so that means, you know, Kind of a flat flower instead of kind of these um, bundled flowers. Um, that, so that kind of goes back to that landing platform again. And skip the highly hybridized plants because some of them have been bred not to seed and not to produce very much pollen. So back to those mason bees in particular, you'll want to include plants that bloom early, March to May. You know, you have some trees and things like crabapple, red bud, currant, elderberry, and 
lupine, and they actually even like those uh, lupines, or lupine, <laughs> dandelions that you may not, but they love them. So here's some example of bee friendly, friendly plants and some picture from the garden of, you know, some plants that we see bees on really, really frequently. You know, you got our refecchias, our black-eyed Susans and our asters. And there's a New England aster there and some sedum. And then the rest there, again, I'll leave here kind of a big list that you can kind of reference back to kind of as, as you'd like to, like to look at those. For, so for pesticide use, um, try to use alternative approaches to pest control, um, such as providing habitat to attract beneficial insects that will prey on the pests. Um, uh, you know, if you do need to use pesticides, try using insecticidal soaps and oils and eco-friendly pest control um, products. Because we do, you know, to create a good habitat. You want to avoid using those systemic bee toxic pesticides in your gardens, particularly some of those neonicotinoids, like the list of names that I won't try to pronounce there, but, <laughs> but those are um, some ones that you definitely want to avoid in your garden. Um, and just try to use as many natural products as, as you, or, or, you know, just kind of the ecosystem of your garden <laughs> alternatively to these products. Um, mud and water, there's another one that, that maybe you don't think of that the bees will need. They need mud. The female mason bees um, pack mud over each one of their uh, eggs. And so you want to have open ground without grass or bark covering nearby. You may even make a little mud pie for them. If you don't have open ground, um, you don't need a huge patch of you know, open dirt by any means, because that's, you know, usually not something you want to do any, anyway. But the soil would want to be moist, um, not a soup, but just have some moisture to it, to the, to the soil there. Um, don't have them directly underneath the nest, because uh, the weak bees emerging might fall into that. So maybe place it a little, a little bit to the side of, of, your, of your habitat, or, you know, even further away, but someplace in your yard. And lastly, you could even create a bee bath with clean, fresh water, like the little photograph that we have there. Um, it's kind of a kind of a neat little um, idea to have a shallow container, like a pie pan with little pebbles or marbles or twigs. That could be a fun project you could do with your kids to create a pretty little bee bath for them, um, for the for for your bees, and make sure to keep it clean and fresh. Um, and, you know, uh, replace that water even daily if you can. So here's an example of the bee house that we made here at McCrory and the one that I'll be talking a little bit more in depth is here are the ones that we made. And those were the ones that are the drilled wooden blocks or logs with liners. So that's the kind that we made here at McCrory Gardens. But um, and some of these requirements for them, I talk about a little bit a little bit later as well. Um, but there are a couple different options that you can use that I'll show some pictures of. Um, tombs that are made from paper and things like that are on the next on the next slide. And then the stacked wooden blocks that you can use make with a router. Um, are, there's also some photos coming up that I'll show you those as well. So here are some of the bee houses that I had kind of mentioned in the last slide, some of the other options that you can do. Um, and you can do Google searches or Pinterest searches and find all kinds of really neat things and um, really neat ideas. I love using them for inspiration and creativity, um, but I do like referring to um, sites written by insect experts or ones that are accountable to have accurate information. Um, to make sure that I'm making the best habitat in terms of usability. Um, I want it to be more than, I guess, a garden decoration. I hope that the insects will find it useful as well. But here are some of those tube, tube ideas um, with, you know, bamboo reeds and different uh, materials to use for those nesting holes. So here's just a few more of those optional um, um, bee houses. Again, this is the stacked lumber, sort of like what we made. This is the similar to what we made, just drilled holes again through the logs or through lumber. 
this is the one that you'd use the router, which is a really neat option um, where you kind of route in those those holes on in each each piece of lumber and then you can remove each layer and look and see what's inside um, and it'd be really easy to clean and kind of observe as well so if you have access to a router that might be a neat option for you and then again here's the kind of rolled parchment paper or rolled paper in these um, in a can as an option too So now we're coming to assembling your actual bee hotel. Here are some supplies that you might need. Um, again, you can refer back to this um, when you're looking for those supplies and use this kind of as a list, but you'll need lumber or a log if you wanna drill nesting holes, drills and drill bits. Um, I go into which to use. You might wanna vary your sizes between a quarter inch and three eighths inch, but um, mostly um, kind of around that 5 16th inch. You might want a roof piece or a removable back so that you can um, have the back of those tubes, of those nesting tubes protected. And then also you can remove it to pull out the parchment paper that I'll have you, I'd have you um, line those wooden holes with. You'd need parchment paper, a scissors to cut it. A dowel is really handy to roll it tight enough to fit inside those nesting holes. Um, and then just different types of screws um, to, to fasten it together. Or as an alternative, you can also build a frame um, to use those paper or bamboo straws instead of drilling or using a router, if, especially if you might not have access to those kind of tools. You can try that as an option as well. If you are choosing to drill wood, or is particularly lumber, make sure to use untreated wood, um, really any wood except cedar, which naturally repels insects. Um, and then again, make sure to make your holes um, deep enough, at least six inches deep for them. Um, as I mentioned, I like to vary those sizes between a quarter inch to three eighths. And if you do stack it, you can see what we did to be careful to avoid the pre-drilled nesting holes. So we actually drilled the, we cut the lumber into um, the different angle that we liked, that we thought would look nice. Then we drilled these holes, um, the nesting holes themselves. A drill press would be very handy. We just used a hand drill and you have to be very careful to go, you know, when you're drilling such a deep hole for it to stay straight. Um, and then before we drilled those, we made sure to mark um, gaps where we would put the screws to fasten them together so that you wouldn't have a screw going right through those nesting holes. Here's just some tips for um, the parchment paper section of it on how to cut that, how to um, line each hole, and how to make sure that you have parchment paper, paper sticking out the back end and kind of folded down the back because you do want to make sure the holes are closed on that back end. And if there's a tail sticking out the back, you can also pull the tubes out really easily. So lastly on that part, just a couple more tips on how to do that back piece and the tails of the parchment paper. Now for the roof piece, so that can be kind of your desired look. Um, I like to have a little pitch to it so that, you know, moisture or, you know, a rain would run off of it. And again, try to locate points that are clear of any, any nesting tubes when you drill, when you attach that roof piece. So when you're, when you have your house all built and you're ready to, ready to hang it up, um, remember to place it three to six feet above the ground and away from tall vegetation. Mounting it on a building facing southeast is a really ideal with a warm morning sun. Um, and you can watch for predatory action and, you know, take actions to try to protect it if you notice any of that happening. Um, you can paint it or mark it to make it more colorful if you want. The random markings on the face actually help orient the bees um, to which holes are theirs, which is Kind of, I think kind of a fun thing that you could do um, as sort of a project. Um, don't paint the inside of the holes, although I don't think you'd want to go through that trouble. <laughs> and remember those colors that the bees like, and don't forget to observe those bees, which we'll talk about in the next Latin slide. 
So here are some just different things to think of as you're going forward and some things to consider. Um, just to watch that it is protected from really, at least really strong rain and wind. You can angle it slightly down. Um, put those, make sure to have your materials out really early in the spring before those um, bees are active and also to be harvested and replaced the, in the fall and then replace those tubes um, before that spring time as well. Um, some fun things you can do with family or um, is just observing different activities around your bee hotel, like pollen on the female when she returns. Um, a clean belly means that she has mud, which is also really neat. I love how a lot of those native bees kind of cover their whole body with pollen. <laughs> um, when the female's adding her final mud plug, you, you know, you can go look at them at night with a flashlight or in the early morning and different, different uh, just activities that you can observe with your new bee hotel. So here's just some links to some other really useful websites that can give you more information on um, building bee hotels or on some native bees like mason bees and leaf cutter bees directly. Also, my contact information if you have any questions or want me to walk through you any or through any part of making the bee house with you, I'm very happy to do that too. Again, just some more sites, a whole bunch. If you just love this and you're all about it, there's a whole lot of information out there. And these, here's just some really fun ones that you can, you know, go explore. So thank you for joining me and learning uh, more about building a bee habitat in your yard.